Welcome to Terrible Lizards, a podcast about dinosaurs with Dr. David Home and Izzy Lawrence. On this week's episode of Terrible Lizards, Dave explains the trouble with working out what bits of dinosaurs are for, while I bang on about bad dates and giant wrens. Hello and welcome to episode three yes. of series nine of Terrible Lizards. Yes, it is the March episode, the best episodes uh, for spring. Are we guessing, is it Easter episode? It's, technically... uh, it's not till the first week of April, I think. Oh, that's a shame. Well, we'll have to wait until next month to open our dinosaur Easter eggs. Uh. Uh, so um, until then, I am Izzy Lawrence and opposite me on the internet is the magnificent Dr. David Ho, uh, who is a paleontologist extraordinaire. <laughs> what? He's laughing. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll accept the compliment. <laughs> I think, I think, I think we've both we've both got the um, lurgy that's uh. going around, which isn't COVID but is annoying. So if you hear us being a bit nasally, that might be the reason. Let the reason be snot. Um, well, talking of snot, Dave, are we going to talk about dinosaur snot that doesn't preserve? Um, I wasn't planning on it. No, um, though we had a question about that one. <laughs> I think did they did they we have did, snot we did. Their noses? It's amazing what you get off. The thing that's on my mind, I I did a I done a blog post for the first time in ages because my blog, partly because I've been doing this, partly because I've been doing books, um, just virtually stopped writing it. But and and blogs as a whole just seem to have vanished, which is a shame because blogs are good. Still read blogs, people. You're such a man of the early noughties. You really are. Yes, I know. Um, but yeah, I I I did a post about display behaviour and understanding that in dinosaurs because a thing that I've seen multiple times over the years and it's come around again is there the oh you just call it a display feature when you don't know what it's for almost inevitably followed by the line of it's like archaeologists when they don't know what it's for and they just say it has ritualistic or religious purposes and I've seen that so many times it's untrue uh, including even from colleagues I, I literally drafted my blog post and then a friend of mine put that literally on Twitter going, oh, people should stop saying it's just a display paper. It's just like archaeologists saying, oh, you're say, ah, no. Um, and this has come about at least in part because there have been a couple more papers recently talking about display behaviours. And the long and the short of it is, as far as I'm concerned, as someone who's written, as regular listeners will know and have heard repeatedly, I've written a lot about this stuff. I've written, I think, probably more papers than anyone else ever on <laughs> display in dinosaurs and pterosaurs and related things. So does it, are you saying it feels like a personal attack? At this I'm point? saying it does feel like a personal attack because it feels Aww. like people haven't read all the work that I've been doing for the last decade or if they have, they've completely misunderstood it. Um, and as someone who goes out of his way to do quite a lot of outreach and engagement with science communication, that's very, very annoying. Um, so here's a chance to set the record straight for yet another group of people who've already heard it and still not reaching the people who need to hear it. Um yeah. Can, can we diagnose display features in the fossil record? Kinda is the answer. Um, there's a lot of different ways of potentially doing it. Um, and certainly people in the past, uh, sorry, academics in the past and academics still have an annoying habit of themselves not understanding it very well and are making almost appeals of, well, we don't really know what it is, so maybe it's display. And there are times when you can kind of get away with that, and there are times when you really can't. Um, I think the problem is, obviously, to outsiders looking in or other academics who don't know this stuff, it's impossible to see the difference between the two. Um, and yet it is there. And so there's a whole bunch of reasons or a whole bunch of layers of types of evidence that is available that you can use to try and diagnose this kind of stuff and it really comes down to understanding how display features work in living animals and that is something we have a very very good handle on which is why it's relatively easy to get that as a model for understanding it in extinct things so how how do we understand it in living animals is the is the question well the i mean the thing we can really do is we, we can actually test it you know classically we have things like uh, what are called choice chambers so you would have a um a, a, a box if, it, if it's something small like a, a small bird something like a zebra finch and a zebra finch is a very common thing for this kind of experiment they're birds that do very well in captivity they're small so you can get lots of them they have lots of features on you them you can fit them in a box 
you can fit them in a small box um so literally you have a a box you know seriously not much bigger than a couple of shoe boxes um divided into three so one long section and then two relatively short sections this is one of those things which is really easy to show at a picture and very hard to do on a podcast um and what you do is you'd have a your female in the long section and then one male each so two males one each in the two short sections with basically a barrier between a solid barrier between the two males and a long perch and the idea being basically that the female is in the long bit and she can hop along her perch or move along and look at either of the two males but she can't look at them both at the same time and the males can't see each other and the idea being that if you find a receptive female and they'll start putting out signals or it's if they're seasonal breeders then you know roughly when they're breeding you put them in and see which male she prefers by simply watching and seeing how much time she spends in front of each of the two now i've been at parties and it could be just the male she wants to avoid <laughs> it could be that <laughs> yes um <laughs> so but, but thing, things like that and then we can obviously do lots and lots of experiments with lots and lots of females and lots and lots of different males and you soon build up quite an accurate picture of do they like a certain color or do they like a certain pattern or things like this um another classic one that we do uh, in the field um is uh, tail length in swallows is an absolute classic experiment another one with um widow birds in africa which also have really long tail plumes and basically you can cut the plumes cut them in half or cut them off the males oh, no. or you can get the ones that you've cut off and glue them onto other males and you soon <laughs> find that the ones with the tails cut off off, the females won't go near them they pair late in the season they have fewer offspring Aww. and the ones with extra long tails um the females go gaga over and they'll mate immediately and they'll have loads of what are called demurely called epcs extra pair copulations in other words the other females running over and um enjoying the male's company on the side uh before going back to their homely male uh, and lots of this going on you also find that those males that you've added to their tails tend to die very early because ah. actually they couldn't grow them that extra long tail this is what we call an honest signal you can't cheat that signal if you could grow a longer tail you stop being able to fly and carry it and you're much more vulnerable to predators um so we do have a bunch of um systems and some of which are extremely well tested of basically showing that yes females do prefer more exaggerated and ornamented males of all kinds of different types i'm just slightly upset now because now all i'm thinking about is how many swallows lives were ruined in a very <laughs> anthropomorphizing greatly but imagine if you're taking all that energy to grow a tail and then it gets cut off some gig you don't cup, yeah. you lose your girlfriend to some other guy with a who's got you or tail so stuck, on. stuck on yeah and then he dies anyway there's no happiness here apart from you know that one male for a short time and the females feel cheated i imagine ah well <laughs> <laughs> this is this is playing gods i'm not sure i like it i think so, i think so, we so, should be they should there should be some sort of way that a, a swallow can sort of like say that it's okay a bit like you know when you see all these programs on the internet like you know I, I was going to say kissing programs, but what am I thinking of? Uh, love is blind. And, ah, right. You know, things like that. At least those people who've gone into those experiments know that they're experiments. All these zebra finches and swallows have no idea, and I feel kind of sad. Oh, well. But, <laughs> right. So it's but the, the scientist. Yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> but the short version is, therefore, that actually we have a very good idea of the sort of things that birds do. Yeah, and it's, again, it's not just birds. We've done it on fish and mammals and all kinds of other stuff as well uh, and insects for that matter um but also that gives you a, a general feeling overall of of how these signals and how these patterns kind of work and again this honesty of the these signals is a really common feature that they are what well, i the words i use like exaggerated features um you know they they do something that is very display silly though that sounds but you know that that is actually what they're for and very often it's a penalty by definition again the the long tail thing or the bright colors or things like this they cost extra effort to grow uh, and to maintain and to lug around if it's heavy or it's a penalty if it's bright you know the the bright orange that you get on things like uh, zebra finches is uh, keratin ker ke keratin which is not keratin if i'm saying yes. it right uh, but anyway it's a very bright orange chemical it's one of the things that make carrots orange i think 
Um, but you only get that in certain foods. So there's a cost right there because you've got to forage for just those foods and focus on those foods if you want to pick up that bright orange to then put it into your colors so that you can then produce that color and things like this. Um, so yeah, p penalties and honest signals, um, you know, th this is a real core of display features. And so this is the kind of thing that you can start looking for as evidence that something is a signal. So there's that, um, you know, we've I'm sure we talked about like, you know, mechanical functions before you know we we know where muscles attach uh we know roughly what they're doing we can work out the the mechanisms of muscle operation and things like this and so that's when you, again you can start looking for these things so you know a classic example being you know pterosaur head crests lots and lots of people had argued over the years oh well you know they're they're, they're a flight sig they're a flight thing they're a control service they help them fly and it's like well are they because you know if they're that effective to help you fly why haven't the birds evolved and why haven't the bats evolved them and why that's didn't the engineers put them on the planes oh, well right um, so that's an obvious reason to suggest that they're not. You know, there, there's this. The argument always just was, well, it is without actually any kind of mechanistic analysis of this. Whereas the very obvious thing, the putting a big slab of bone uh, on a flying animal is a a ton of weight, and then b sticking it on its head. If it wants to turn its head whilst flying, which many flying things probably would, and particularly when lots of them are catching food with their heads, probably isn't a very good idea at all. Particularly in things like high winds. Um, so actually it immediately looks like a penalty because it's really heavy and it doesn't look like it gives you a mechanical advantage. It looks like a mechanical disadvantage. This is what you'd expect of some kind of display feature. So that immediately makes it look like quite a good case. The other thing that it has, again, sticking with the pterosaur head crest, is that it's incredibly variable. You know, convergent evolution is absolutely rampant in, um, well, I was going to say animals, but, you know, animals and plants. There are very often only a handful of solutions to certain mechanical problems. It's a reason that animals that want to run fast have long legs. Uh, it's a reason that claws appear um, and have very similar shapes when they're doing similar things. Um, you know, you look at stuff like, you know, digging. Digging is a mechanically complicated thing. And aardvarks, anteaters, armadillos, moles, marsupial moles, golden moles, all these things have very similar shaped claws, fingers, wrists, uh, elbows, shoulders, and even bits of the vertebrae because there's really only one way to dig very effectively if you're a normal four-limbed animal. And they have all Yes, right. So, but they've all evolved that same solution. Would you really get as many different heads and head crests in all the wildly different pterosaur lineages that we see if this was a really good way of controlling flight? Again, there's a reason that tail planes, there's about three different designs and you see them on thousands and thousands and thousands of aircraft. You know, you wouldn't expect to see that degree of variation. What you also see is lots of variation within the species. Again, if this is mechanical, they should all be focusing on the same one whereas sexually selected structures and display structures are highly variable you know moose all have antlers or at least you know the males do um you know, the, the horned antelopes all have horns. Peacocks all have tails. Yes, but they all look a bit different to each other. Things that grow very, very quickly um, and have, the, you know, and have some kind of big random feature like this um, tend to look quite different to each other, even within the species. There will be quite a bit of variation. And again, that's exactly what we see in things like pterosaur head crests. It's exactly what we see in things like frills of ceratopsians. Triceratops got those little spikes around the edge. Those vary in number. They're not entirely uniform. Um, exactly the sort of thing you'd expect for this kind of variation that's going on. Uh, and also these things change in individuals as they grow. Uh, this we've definitely talked about at one time or another. This is a classic feature of, uh, in particular, sexual display features, is that they grow relatively late in the animal's growth. When you're young, the only thing which is important is surviving until you're old enough to breed. Once you're old enough to breed, there's a trade-off between surviving a bit longer and actually having offspring. And at this point, you need to invest. You know, you look at cows and sheep, and when they're babies, they might have the tiny nubs of horns. They can be three quarters or four fifths of the size of an adult and still have little nubs of horns. And then suddenly, whoosh, these things absolutely grow enormously at the last minute. Classic display features. Yep, baby pterosaurs don't have head crests. Baby ceratopsians only have very little ones. Adults have them. They're massive. 
I'd argue things like horns that sheep grow and goats grow, surely they also serve a purpose, even though it is for breeding, because they are used to fight with. So how do you distinguish between a display feature which has a function and also is useful um, to attract mates? Uh, It's very, very hard um, for a start because, yeah, often you do have this co-option. So a big question, and again, something that I think people overlook and that we've definitely discussed or I've definitely discussed in various papers with co-authors um is that kind of co-option of features and this shouldn't be a surprise again if you've grown the biggest horns to be the biggest fightiest strongest male out there you don't want to have to fight every single time and actually females are probably just as perfectly interested in being sure that you're the biggest male without having to watch you fight every single time um And again, this comes back to the honesty of those signals. If you could cheat a big horn that made you look bigger and stronger than you actually are, that's not going to last evolutionarily very long because sooner or later somebody's going to challenge you and then when you get absolutely battered despite the fact that you've got the biggest horns, you know, your genes aren't carrying on. Um, The question that really kicks in there, which again I think people don't think about, is what might be the process? Did these start as something that were combat efficient and then later became for combat and display? Or perhaps did they just start as primarily display and then later became combat and display? In other words, what a feature does at the point that you look at it in the animal's evolutionary history may not be what it was doing, you know, 500,000 years or a couple of million years earlier. Elephant tusks are a classic example of this. We know elephant tusks are under sexual selection. Um, uh, males, Females prefer males with bigger tusks. Males with bigger tusks are usually bigger and and usually win fights. However, they also um, fight off lions with them, and they knock trees over with them, and they'll dig with them, so they're doing lots of other things. These these tusks are under both natural selection and under sexual selection, and they're being used for display, and they're being used for combat. To just say they're a display feature isn't really a great argument, um, and, you know, and that would be probably misleading. However, if you think about the very first tusks, you know, the first proto-tusk that started sticking out of the face, they might have been decent weapons, probably better than an elephant that didn't have them. Um, so maybe they started off as purely combat, but once they started getting quite big, you could see how display could then easily kick in as a secondary feature, and there's perhaps going to exaggerate them faster than a pure weapon would. Um, and it, they're going to have to be quite long long before they're quite useful for things like digging uh, you know or fighting off a lion you know two big male elephants butting heads each of which with a little stabby tusk okay that's quite good if you can stab the other guy would it do much to a lion that's down on the ground probably not so not as much as your foot Right. So you can see that maybe, I mean, I don't know enough about elephants, we're just using it as a hypothetical, but you can see that maybe those started off as a weapon and then became co-opted for display and only later became co-opted for other features. But just looking at them now and going, they do this one thing, which is how people tend to think of these things, A, misses that evolutionary history, and B, misses the fact that they are doing more than one thing as well. So that can be a real mess. And again, I think people not appreciate that and then you know effectively only testing one hypothesis or only thinking about this in one term doesn't really advance the subject in terms of talking about how these things might have appeared and what they might be used for okay so um what was the question that i should be asking now um well <laughs> you know what else is that you know so these things yep. these things grow fast they're very variable within species. They're very variable between species. You know, all the different pheasants have different displays. All the different birds of paradise have different displays. All the different deer and antelope have subtly different horns to each other, even when they are fighting with each other. They might, or, or sheep, they might be built along certain patterns, but you still get this intraspecific variation. How do they line up mechanically? Are they doing something effectively, and therefore are we seeing convergence? Or are they, you know, really obviously lacking some kind of clear functionality maybe we can do some tests on that um are they a disp- uh, sorry are they a penalty of some form uh you know the plates on stegosaurus uh don henderson did a really nice analysis of this worked out they're about 10 percent of the total weight of the animal is just those plates that's an enormous chunk of bone to grow and lug around for your entire life 
um, you know, and people are oh, it's for thermoregulation. And it's like, well, you could just grow a flap of skin. That would have been a lot well. less energy and would have been a lot more effectively a radiator than growing huge chunks of bone that you have to lug around all the time. Um, so things like that, you know, is something that you can really look at. And so I think the mistake that people make is it can be quite easy to look at something and go, okay, I think that's display without really explaining all all of those background evidence and kind of chain of reasoning and it look like you haven't justified it properly particularly if you have justified it in a bunch of other groups already for example i've written a couple of papers now on protoceratops it's a really good model for ceratopsians because it's got so many good specimens and it does all of these things there's no obvious mechanical function it grows very very rapidly it varies interest specifically um, every single ceratopsian has subtly different horns and frills and we know about that growth rate that that's going on it's a fairly obvious penalty it's a big heavy thing to lug around even with all the big holes in it yes brackets triceratops is doing something a bit weird but that's one species out of 50 60 uh you know an awful lot that we know of that fits all the things that we pretty much expect from a display feature to fit just talk about the frills now let's not get too much into the horns which are subtly different um therefore it's fairly reasonable to go they're a display feature and if you see yet another ceratopsian pop up and oh look it's got yet another slightly different frill it's probably a display feature too and so too are all the different uh, crests that we see in the hadrosaurs for the same reason they're all subtly different to each other um their juveniles don't have them they grow late in entogeny they're highly variable within and between species um you know they're, they're probably a bit of a penalty in terms of the weight and they probably affect breathing this is what you'd expect from a display feature um and so that's really where this comes from a lot of things i think it is fairly easy with just a little bit of even thought yes obviously ideally you'd like a nice big data set and a nice big complicated analysis to work through all of this stuff and the fossil record isn't like that but you can point to a lot of things pretty quickly and just go well look it's not present in the juveniles it's very it varies between all the species there's no obvious mechanical thing this is probably display and that's not just making it up because you don't know and the final thing to say on that line of course is that display features are unbelievably rampant in living organisms you know god there's barely a lineage that doesn't have them particularly when they're a half decent size you know small burrowing things don't tend to things that come out at night and don't have particularly good vision don't tend to so we don't tend to see them in bats we don't tend to see them in rodents but once you've got a half-sized animal that comes out during the day most bird lineages have you know and even i could probably go as far as saying most species have some kind of display feature so do almost all the big mammals um so do loads and loads and loads of reptiles so do plenty of fish so do plenty of amphibians um it really shouldn't be a surprise that we'd expect these to be very common in dinosaurs and pterosaurs and plenty of other extinct things as well so are there any dinosaurs which have a thing which obviously because pterosaurs i mean i think we've established on this podcast they're definitely a display but is there anything that you're still not sure of or are, there's a big argument around a feature on a certain dinosaur uh, well you know the sailing spinosaurus which we've talked about you know i'm pretty convinced that's predominantly a display feature and i think that's also probably true of the head crest and indeed the kind of inverted commas tail fin uh that gets called a paddle i don't think it's a paddle um um, but that doesn't mean that it's not probably used for thermoregulation as well, particularly the sail. Um, and then you get sails in other things like uh, Aranosaurus, Iguanodontian, that's from North Africa as well. Um, there's some other stuff like this where it's not obvious immediately obvious what it is because at least in part we lack a clear analogy you know things like horns you know tail streamers in birds you know there's microraptor and a whole bunch of other you know cretaceous birds flying around with long tail streamers just like modern birds and they're flying as well and they're brightly colored i mean this is exactly what we'd expect um that makes it particularly easy to line that stuff up um but there are a few um certainly yeah the the kind of sail back thing again i'm quite happy with that with spinosaurus but we we've got no juveniles you know i think it's only a matter of time till we turn up a half decent juvenile of a not just spinosaurus you know but there's ichthyo and in uh, in thailand or laos i forget which and the other stuff in um brazil um you know and baryonyx uh and the other baryonic kinds have longer 
spines in the back but not really as long but we just need to find a juvenile with very obvious short spines and that's you know pretty much a giveaway at that point particularly if Can they're you... about two-thirds sized and they've got a very short one that's exactly the growth pattern that you'd predict can you imagine the growing pains of growing extra spines out your back or extra long vertebrae out well oh. they're, they're, they're just they're just sticking up fast but you know is that any worse than sheep going from virtually no horns to those giant spirals in you know a few months um, I, don't know. But, I think everything that you're using so you're using your vertebrae to sort of move with and flex and yeah but it but it looks like the so this is something that's been pointed out you know you the, the those neural spines the actual big bits that stick up they're, they're kind of in two parts there's a bottom bit which is probably where all the musculature sits and then the top is built differently and that's almost certainly just sticking up with nothing on it so they they don't need to like complicatedly rearrange your musculature or it's really going to affect your spine flexion or anything like that would you get stretch marks over the skin i think you get stretch marks at the skin sure oh probably yeah oh ouch <laughs> curious enough not exactly my area of expertise um <laughs> but i can easily um, I, imagine it yeah i mean i just remember being a teenager and my thighs just dying because my femurs were growing yeah that's horrible i mean oh yeah but uh, but our growth rate is absolutely extraordinary when we go through a you know the real kind of burst from, of growth from the second smallest in my class to the largest in the school including the male teachers hi in a year thank yeah. you body why <laughs> i wasn't trying to attract any mates i can assure you and i was incapable of it as well and every time i got up i fainted it was not a good bit of evolution that i think uh yeah wasn't yeah. good yeah I, to, I just be, to be, to be went... fair trying to use humans for models for this stuff yeah. is really a good idea <laughs> I mean, are Wookiees more attractive than Ewoks? I mean, really? Uh, Depends what you're into, I think. <laughs> uh, but yeah, but there is there is that, you know, the analogy that you've been going on about, about, you know, religious versus, you know, I always think of it as, is this a pestle or is it something else? Uh, but uh, I won't say that because that's naughty. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Took me a second to work out where that was going. I mean, yeah, you know, but the, I mean, the irony is, you know, I can't really speak for the anthropologist. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I'm sure there is stuff that they don't know what it is. And I think I think they've probably got at least part of the same problem. I mean, you probably know better than me. But, you know, if you lack an obvious analogy, if it doesn't look like anything you've dug up before and it doesn't have an obvious, you know, that's not obviously a sword or a spear or a, something good for digging holes or drilling holes or carrying something, it, it must be a temptation to infer that it's, it is functionally useless, but someone went to the trouble of making it and therefore it was important to them for whatever reason. And they Therefore, something cultural or religious is an obvious thing to go down. Um, I don't. I'm know trying how... to remember the anthropologist's name, and it's it's doing. I've, I've interviewed him, and he works with um, Dunbar a lot. But oh. um, he sort of says the things that make humans unique is wrapping. So we're all we naturally wrap things. We wrap ideas with meanings and that sort of yeah. things. We wrap objects with ideas. And we're the only species that seems to decorate almost everything and decorate our clothing and everything else. And as a result, it's incredibly difficult to work out what's practically useful for survival and what makes nice wrapping paper and what yeah. meaning we can imbue so this whole idea that we separate religion and science is incredibly modern like literally the last 150 years is kind of when we've been doing it trying to separate that out you know like yeah. Isaac Newton spent most of his time trying to you know make the <laughs> philosopher's stone and create yeah. gold so this is yeah it, it's it's an incredibly new thing anyway so most anthropologists listening will just go well everything's religious anyway Anyway, so it's a very silly point. Well, that, um. that, and that, that's quite probably fair enough. But again, you know, the the, the dinosaur talking... analogy, you know, it it removes the idea that no, removes the idea. That's a bad phraseology. It making that argument of you don't know what it is so it's display i see where it's coming from and absolutely people have done that without any evidence whatsoever before but at the same time we know that evolution is incredibly good at getting rid of something that isn't useful and it is very very good at keeping and exaggerating something that is useful and if it's not obviously functional it probably is display because that really is how sex works and sexual selection works 
Um, it is very unlikely that the plates of Stegosaurus didn't do anything and evolution just went, ah, it's fine, keep 10% of your mass for 50 million years and when it doesn't do anything, you'll survive great. That's really not how it works. You look at things like, um, you know, flightless birds. When birds first start evolving flightlessness, the rapidity of the evolution to shrink the sternum, drop the flight musculature, um, even reducing the hollowness of bones because that contains its own kind of penalties which are make life difficult for birds. This stuff happens incredibly rapidly. So yeah, the idea that ceratopsians would, or pterosaurs would knock around for tens or hundreds of millions of years, these huge chunks of bone all over them, which didn't really do anything, we just haven't worked out what it is yet. Um, it really doesn't fly very well, because again, that's just not how this stuff tends to operate. I remember the archaeologist slash anthropologist I was thinking of, and it's Clive Gamble. That's his theory of wrapping, so... I just thought I'd wrap the end of that little bit up. Because, I mean, it's not just sexual selection that we have difficulty knowing what dinosaurs are doing, though, is it? it that isn't the only, you know, because I know there's been a lot of... Um, like our, our first episode, we talk about Tyrannosaurus rex and yep. what it's doing in its hunting methods. And predation and scavenging. Yeah, and, you know, and then that's an, that's an absolute classic as well. You know, I'm I've still, in one of my papers, um, you know, seven or eight years ago now, I did with um, Darren Tankey... Um, and I, I coined the phrase carnivore consumed um, to, to avoid using predator prey. Because everyone just says, oh, predator prey, predator prey. Like we know that that's a thing in the fossil record. That's the thing. It's like, here is a dinosaur. Here, here, is our, uh, here is our theropod with teeth all over it. And here is the bones of another animal in its stomach. That's a predator prey interaction. It's like, well, not if it just found it and ate it. It didn't kill yeah. it at all. It's not a predator. Um, you, know, if you, if you, you know, you can find vultures with the bones of you know all kinds of different animals in them you know um egyptian vultures are great as following sheep bones it's the majority of what they eat is sheep bones do they kill them no basically never they're not predators so just because you've got that a, a an, an ecological interaction is absolutely there doesn't mean it's a predator prey interaction and therefore just defaulting to that phrase even if it is something that's kind of in our mindset and we tend to use it and even if we don't necessarily mean it in that sense i think it just lacks clarity and it's it's asking for trouble so just don't use it unless you know and of course the vast majority of the time we don't know i bet that cows accidentally eat more aphids than ladybirds Oh, probably, yeah. I mean, and this is the classic thing. You know, the there's no really such a thing as a herbivore or, or a carnivore because, yeah, it's, ca it's not cow even. cows eat caterpillars and aphids, and lions eat, eat grass when they can. It's but we're not we're not saying that cows are predators. No. In that sense, even though they probably do more damage to the populations of creatures than actual predators of those creatures. Yeah, it's it's exactly that. Well, it, you know, it's it to a degree is similar with the display thing. And when I talked about, you know, that co-option and different opportunities and what might actually be driving it, it's about clarity. Because if you say this is a predator-prey interaction, you are suggesting ecologically how those two species interacted. And if you don't actually know that, I think think that's actively misleading in using that terminology and we shouldn't really do it that way um and yeah it can be very hard bordering on impossible to know it does depend on the system somewhat so for example you know we've got things like pteranodon there's some pteranodons with some fish bones in them they probably caught those because actually if you're a pterosaur flying out over the ocean in much the way if you're a pelican or a gannet or a puffin flying out over the ocean now you will pick up a dead fish if you find it that's a free meal but there's not many dead fish just floating randomly on the surface you usually have to kind of go after them and catch them and so you're probably a predator or that many sort of excited fish jumping out and accidentally landing in your mouth yes uh yeah. you know that's that's very very unlikely um whereas you know big terrestrial carnivores a dead things can hang around for quite a while because they you know they don't sink like they would in the sea and you might be able to find them but also you know there's loads of kleptoparasitism going on so it basically kleptoparasitism you know theft parasite that's literally what it means so lions will steal food off hyenas hyenas will steal food off lions both of them will steal food off cheetahs um that doesn't mean they killed them we know that they're 
predators fully in their own right, of course. But if you looked at what they're doing, so for example, lions don't usually go after small antelope and gazelle and things like that. They will, but it's not a major part of their diet. It's the vast majority of the diet of things like cheetahs. So if you do find lions with lots of bones of baby antelope in them, that's probably kleptoparasitism. And if you did the same from fossil lions two million years ago, if you knew there were cheetahs around, I'd say that's probably kleptoparasitism as well, because I've got a very good and clear direct analogy. Once we start going further back, of course, we just don't know. Um, and so, yeah, finding bones in an animal is not necessarily a great indicator of whether or not it was a predator or what it picked up. I have a question about domestic cats and dogs. Are they kleptoparasites? Well, I mean, a lot of things are, okay, you know, if, much as we just talked about, you know, the no such thing as a herbivore, no such thing as a carnivore. It, you know, most things will steal food if they can. The question is just how much are they doing it? So obviously there are some seabirds which aren't quite specialised in that, but it's a major part of their ecology. You know, seagulls, this is, saying that just to annoy Dave, if my friend, if you're listening, because he hates me saying seagulls, he hates all people saying seagulls, they are gulls, there's no such thing as a seagull, he delights in telling me repeatedly, so of course I always do it. Um, you know, gulls, um, guillemot skewers and stuff like this, actually not guillemots, you know, but gulls and skewers uh, and animals like that, you know, regularly steal food off each other or off other species, you know, Kleptoparasitism is a fairly major part of their ecology. It's a big part of their diet and where they get their food from. It's why you have to eat your chips against the seawall because they can't get you. Well, right, you know, and where do you think they evolved that strategy for and where they've been good at? Because they're literally stealing fish out of the mouths of others on the wing. So someone standing around with some chips not looking is an absolute open goal as far as they're concerned. I think uh, we've got our neighbour's cats who are barely kittens. They've been coming around and stealing my cat's food. And I, I just wanted to say this story because I don't know if you know because I don't know if I've told you, but the cat that keeps coming around is so cute and so fluffy and we it was here for ages so we took the little collar off and rang the number because it was here for like four hours and we thought this owner's probably worried and we rang him up and they said oh we just live down the road so we took him round they said he's such a lovely pussycat what's his name and they went Lucifer Oops. so I have Lucifer round being a kleptoparasite <laughs> over my cat's biscuits Yes. Yeah, so I'm sure most things will steal stuff if they can. Um, it's just a question of whether or not they're, you know, really pushing that as a major part of their lifestyle or whether or not it's fairly minor. So, I mean, would, if you were to, if you could set up a study to decide if something is a kleptoparasite or a predator, in a, what percentage of its food would be significant in your in oh, a zoologist's <laughs> mind? I'm just curious because I don't know, you know. I, I've, I haven't read enough kleptoparasite papers. Um, Fair enough. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, one thing I always tell all my students is, you know, that with biology, you know, definitions are fuzzy. So are mammals. Well, yes, it's, you know, it's it's not <laughs> physics and chemistry where this atom is this atom and it only ever is that atom. And, OK, maybe you can add a neutron and it's a subtly different one, but it's still basically the same thing. You know, we have trouble delineating species. We have trouble delineating juveniles from adults. We have trouble delineating sex in lots of things. Um, so defining what makes a kleptoparasite versus a predator versus a scavenger, yes, there are some obvious ones, you know, vultures that are getting 90 plus percent of their diet from dead things, or cheetah that are getting 90 plus percent of their diet from predati from predation, they're fairly easy to deal with. But after that, you've got a massive grey area. And again, these things will vary massively from individual to individual or population to population or exact circumstance. Um, and also things like omnivores, which might only predate a small amount of the time that still are predators, yet will happily yeah. eat, eat carrots. Yeah, or or just shift diet as they grow, or shift diet in their in their locality. I mean, and and even Bears. you know, going back to our you know display features, you know, talking about sexual dimorphism. I got this great paper on sexual dimorphism in reptiles that was cited several times, and it was I can't remember which species, but there was a pond, one of the North American pond turtles, and depending on which population you sample from across North America, you could have males being up to fifty percent bigger than females, or females being twenty percent bigger than males. That's all wild different you know 50 percent bigger uh, as a male is about the limit of sexual dimorphism it's rare in reptiles that you get a male that's more than 50 percent bigger than a female so for that to be not just go down to zero but go out the other side and again that's just a sample 
sampling in the, I mean, the paper's quite old, but that was just a sampling over, you know, a few years or a couple of decades. Over the last million years that that species has existed in North America, you can bet that somewhere they were more exaggerated at both ends. Um, and so again, just, just going, oh, well, these are highly sexually dimorphic or, oh, there's sexual dimorphism in this species because you measured it in a population where it is extreme, but you didn't measure it in a population where it doesn't exist at all. Why is that? I mean, would there be an environmental reason for that, or is it just the preferences of the females and males it's, there? It's Why probably, would that? My guess is, is that there's a lot of local selective pressures. Um, so it could be there's an issue with survivorship or an issue with territory. You know, maybe there are only a handful of selected places which are suitable for making a nest, in which case there's now rampant competition between the females beating the other females up over the best place to lay their eggs. And so, so big females the biggest win. wins. Yeah. Or maybe there's really high predation levels, in which case you've got to have the most eggs for any of them to survive. You know, maybe the males are under limited competition for some reason. Maybe it's the temperature. Maybe it's a local spike in temperature, because obviously they've got temperature sex determination in a lot of these. I, you know, I don't know. Um, but there are some reasons that could clearly drive that locally. So if, if in order to get like lots of small males being prefer preferred, if there are just fewer males being born, there's well, that's no the pressure thing. That's on them the thing. Is there, is there a, is there, is there a pressure for smaller males, or is there a pressure for bigger females? Because either of those will get you a bigger female than a smaller than a male. Yeah. And of course, they're not the same thing. No, and and it could be that there is not a pressure to be a big male because there aren't enough males around because the temperature of the eggs means that there aren't many males being born. Yeah, compared and to you females. think, and you think, well, normally yeah. that wouldn't happen, of course, because it would even out. But you know, maybe for whatever geological reason you know there's only a sandbank on one side of the river is the right kind of sand that you can dig therefore it's always warm because it happens to face the sun or it's always cold or i mean i don't know i'm you know i'm obviously making this up more than a bit but it's at least possible there's some weird things like that going on and yeah and maybe they're temporary you know maybe within a couple of generations that would select for females that dig deeper to get cooler to have more males because males would do better in that system but at least in the short term that population would be skewed in size and if we picked up a drought and killed them all and that was our fossil population of turtles that we found we'd find the females were bigger i mean i know we're gonna get into a whole species definition thing but i mean surely if they're so different in the way that they are just because they're genetically similar do they still count as the same species I mean, but if it's just size well again it depends yeah. how well they breed with each other yeah and uh, you know and um, if, they're, if they're only like big females they're all tiddly well, might right, choose the big but, males instead but again it, could, it could just problem. you know it could just be local you know we we have basically maneless lions in places and we have maned female male maned lionesses in places that doesn't suddenly make them a new species no. it's just local environments which are driving it yeah oh it's it's complicated this Okay. Yeah, okay. it is. Fuzzy fuzzy definitions, fuzzy boundaries. Fuzzy mammals. But scavenging is hard to define, but we can kind of define it. People overuse predator-prey when really they mean carnivore consumed a lot of the time, and that bugs me. And display, yeah, it. you know, we can work it out. A lot of them, it's fairly easy to make a pretty good case. Um, people often don't because spelling out the exact same argument for the next hadrosaur or the next ceratopsian or the next pterosaur with a head crest is a bit pointless if it's effectively the same arguments as all the others. Um, but just a paleontologist shouldn't go, oh, well, it's obviously display, and that's the end of the argument, which some still do, which I think is pretty bad, but also people just going, oh, you haven't explained it, how could that possibly be display, is often a bigger problem still, because often it is a really quite clear case if you just argue through it, and if you understand what is actually driving signalling. Yeah, I, I was just thinking about the scavenging thing again, because it would make a lot of... I mean, if you've got all of these massive herbivores around, just wait for them to die. Yeah, but do you? Because this is this is the thing. We 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 get the big ones. This is, I think, part of the problem. Uh, and there's been some papers about this relatively recently, arguing about again, not just the T. Rex, but now we've moved on to Allosaurus and others, and like, oh, the scavenging of you know sauropod dominated faunas. But that makes the assumption that these faunas are dominated by big adult sauropods, and they almost certainly aren't. They're just the ones that prefer 
preferentially fossilized. There were probably hundreds of babies the size of my dining table or the size of a car or the size of an elephant for every really, really big adult. Um, and so, yeah, when one of those things keeled over, that was absolutely a, a glut of food. Um, and, you know, probably they were more or less immune to predation because they were just so damn big and there was much easier prey available elsewhere in the way that elephants are largely immune to predation now at adult. But that doesn't mean that that's what the ecosystem was built around. Um, and uh, that's a big mistake. And again, it's, we, we see a similar thing with the T-Rex argument. It's like, oh, well, you know, they're just not fighting full-size Edmontosaurus or big adult Triceratops because that's stupidly dangerous and you need to get injured once and that kills you. When there's hundreds of babies that are a fraction of the size um, and are naive and have to forage in terrible areas, eat them. Because um, yeah. again, that's They're what every size. other predator does. But then why evolve such a massive jaw if you don't use it on a, something big? Well, because, again, it might come in useful occasionally. Thing, you know, natural selection will favour survival traits, but it doesn't mean you have to use them all the time. So, you know, the big thumb claw that you see in a lot of sauropods has been argued that it's useful for digging, and that might be very useful e to, A, to get water, or B, to excavate nests. Yeah, totally. You know, you might use that two or three times in your life, but if that's the difference between getting a drink or being able to bury your eggs and not, that's an incredibly important thing you know think about how many animals mate only once in their life you go Ugh. it's a bit rubbish them carrying around ovaries and eggs for 20 years before they have sex what a waste of energy that is well no if it's absolutely crucial to reproduction it's probably a very good idea to carry that around your entire life and still be able to reproduce well fair enough i think we've got loads here so shall we go on to the news we're going to do the news feature for which there is no jingle what is in the news this week dave this month I mean, I know the jingle. What's in the dinosaur news? Oh, what caught your eye? Hey, it's, n it's not quite Kenny <laughs> Everett, is it? <laughs> I'm, 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 uh, I'm a very entertaining uh, person who understands uh, radio. So yes, um, you, um, one thing that I saw is the evolution of dinosaur body size through different developmental mechanisms paper, which sounds really dry. Can you summarise it for me so I know what it was about? Uh, yes, yeah, so this is uh, Pat O'Connor's research group. Um, I think the lead author is Michael Dem Demick. It's D apostrophe E M I C. So I don't know if he's Demick or Demick or how he would pronounce it. And apologise if he's actually listening. Um, but no, very very cool paper. We talked about growth rings loads and loads of times. Basically, looking at growth rings of a whole bunch of dinosaurs, including a whole bunch of things that haven't been looked at before, all oh, in theropods. Um, and the short version is really how did they grow? grow and what they found was there's a lot of variation out there there are things that are growing particularly for the big things which of course really interests me there are ones which are growing very slowly over a very long period of time and other things that are growing very fast like I did when I grew at yes, school. Yes, but yeah. it means, you know, th those are very different strategies for getting big. You know, trees grow slowly over a very long period of time. Um, you know, things like ostriches or, or elephants, you know, in the grand scheme of things, rocket up to large size and then kind of stop when they get there. Um, and it looks like there was no one real pattern for this in big theropods. And actually, even the small ones are doing a variety of different things. Um, so you've got a whole bunch of combinations of different growth periods and different growth rates there are slow growth for very long periods of time fast growth for very short periods of time medium growth for medium length pieces of time um and and kind of everything smushed across there which is really really neat is that what we see in like extant creatures like crocodiles and birds or is that I love the way it's so, looking, so, well, looking cause, wildly cause not, up, well because they're not doing the same thing yeah so yeah. crocodiles are mostly relatively slow growers and grow over extended periods of time birds are mostly racing to a very large size and then stopping yeah. Um, so yeah we're, we're seeing both basically which would explain because they have a common ancestor with both so that is that would make sense that dinosaurs would yeah but what you often find is that one strategy dominates for example you know almost all birds are fast growers you might expect that there is one genetic pathway knocking around about growth where it's relatively easy to switch on and off or you know change it to something else and then that's what you do to get big oh and my the fact god that i just that thought doesn't something. appear to be the case and that they're doing it in multiple different ways is really quite interesting what if 
like Uh-oh. wrens, the smallest birds in England, right? What if they're they not the smallest. are actually firecrests okay. are smaller? Oh, I don't know. Okay, well they're one of the smallest birds. You'll agree. Yeah. In England, what if the re like if they get to the age of like forty? Okay, and they never do, but if they do, they suddenly grow. And there's an actual built-in growth spurt at that point, so big that they could, like, dominate an entire garden and, like, you know, take over a city. That's, okay, he's looking at me like I've ruined his podcast again. <laughs> to be fair, it happens every podcast. So it does. Not sure why people you expect find to be a problem charming, this time. Slash very annoying. Yeah, which people? <laughs> well, they listen. I get, I get, I get nice letters too. You know, it's not just you. <laughs> but you know, they they could be. I can't see of any reason. I mean, I suppose flight is the main constraint of a bird. Uh, yeah, generally, yes. Yeah. Anyway, news, but that was the news. Dinosaurs grew at different rates, depending on their species. And I mean, yeah, I'm not. Uh, you're not. You're, that's not surprising. Well, theropods. So we we don't even know what the others are doing. Well, I I still think it kind of is. I I would have thought that you know the big allosauroids, the big spinosaurs, would have been growing in similar ways to tyrannosaurs because they're relatively close related and doing the same thing. And it doesn't look like they are. And that to me is really interesting. So and that's probably due to obviously environmental pressures. Well, but also different genetic mechanisms evolving to produce that big size. Which means, oh, hang on. So, 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 oh, I, I just had I just have a thought, and it sort of went in my head and then went out again. But that would imply that there are different because there are different genetic mechanisms mechanisms applying a big size. Would that mean the reasons and the advantages would be different to each species of being big? Uh, not necessarily. Fair enough. Just just the you know if there's a pressure for big size, what yeah. whatever mechanism is facilitating that is is going to take off, and it might just be whichever one evolves first, which could that be at sense. random. Anyway, chaps, if you've got a question for Dave which is better than my question about giant wrens why don't you write to us you can do that at terrible it's not much of a Pods challenge is it at gmail.com that was an amazing thought Dave how dare you uh, if you want to find out more about Clive Gamble and rapping and anthropology you can listen to the British Museum member cast it's an early episode I believe it's like episode two or three from ages ago they're just like no why would you want to listen to anthropologists they're no good listen to zoologists and paleontologists they are best Um, me we will be back next month until then if you are a patron please join our patron thank you for your support on patron you can email your questions um, to us or you can write to us on patreon and we will answer them in a special patrons only episode other than that dave do you have any news or anything you need to say rar rar is good rar is good we'll rar in a second because i want to just plug the fact that i've got some kids books coming out you can if we're playing that game i've got some kids books coming out you tell everybody about your kids books i've got two dinosaur kids books coming out in april and another two in june or july they're part of a series of four but they're doing two and two what Um, are they called oh god knows um (laughs) Dave, you're useless. I, I know the titles, but I can't remember which one's coming out when. Okay, well, I mean, it'll be on my blog. We'll, we'll promo it. But I'm, just, I'm really quite pleased with them. Um, the artist done a really good job. So it's, it's cartoony, but the science is there, if that makes sense. What sort of ages do you reckon? Um, I, I remember they're kind of aiming at eight-ish. Um, is good. Which was which is really quite a constraint because they're like you're not allowed many words and you're not allowed any technical language, but we want an explanation of evolution in 200 words for eight year olds with no technical language. Oh, good, that's nice and easy. We will see. <laughs> we'll see who's got the best one because I've got one. I've got a series um, coming out also in April. It's called The Time Machine Next Door. It includes a uh, Kiwi called Wiki, which, you know, he, he snuffles out good facts. And also what's brilliant about my books is I also include a, um, in a Scientist in the Stripe of Socks, I include a, uh, a definition of evolution because they meet Charles Darwin. But yes, um, that's for sort of six to ten year olds, I think, is basically. So eight, that makes sense. <laughs> so if you know any short people, guys, they're in for a treat if, <laughs> with terrible lizard stuff. Um, but yes, so um, do, do get um, pre-order your books. Um, might have called the time machine next door I don't know what Dave's are called he knows but he's refusing to say we'll put all of the information up on our Patreon and on our Facebook follow us using the hashtag terrible list as well and until next month now you can rah Dave thank you for listening to terrible lizards for extra content please go to patreon.com forward slash terrible lizards 
For questions, contact us there or on terriblelizardspod at gmail.com. Buy Dave Hone's dinosaur books, including How Fast a T Rex Run, and to find out about Izzy's podcasts and books, head to iszi.com. Say hello on social media using the hashtag Terrible Lizards. Thank you so much for listening. A review, a recommend, and a follow makes all the difference. Stay stompy. <laughs> <laughs>